Hello. So in the previous two lectures for this segment of the course, we talked about detecting heteroscedasticity, first through a plot, second through formal testing. Um, now that we've detected, we know we have heteroscedasticity, here's the question. What do we do about it? Okay. And before we get into estimating um, the heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors and actually doing analysis with heteroscedastic data, I want to make a, an early point that if you see heteroscedasticity, it can many times actually be a symptom of another problem. Like for example, maybe you have nonlinearity in your relationship. You're trying to, you have a nonlinear relationship and you haven't taken care of that and so you're force feeding it into a um, linear model. All right, so looking at that is really important. Make sure you know, your functional forms are, are right. You may have you may have to do some kind of um, nonlinear transformation, like a log or a quadratic or something like that, um, and that might help with the heteroscedasticity. Um, secondly, it could be a matter of maybe there's some kind of a missing variable. All right, so we haven't talked about omitted variable bias yet. Oh yes, we have. We talked about omitted variable bias um, in a previous chapter, but that can sometimes um, present itself as a form of heteroscedasticity. We just see pattern in the um, residuals, but we aren't able to pick that up into our model, and so we're throwing information away. Well, that could be indicative of you know, a variable being missing. Um, so there are other problems that it could be simply a symptom of, all right, rather than it actually itself being the problem. So the first thing really, if you see heteroscedasticity, is do some investigation to see why it's there. Um, if you can eliminate it by, um, you know, building a better model, then do so. That really, I think, is the first step when we deal with heteroscedasticity. Now, bottom line is, though, a lot of times you're going to do that. That may improve your model a little bit, but you're not going to get rid of the heteroscedasticity entirely. It's just going to be there. All right. And what do you do when you've done all that stuff? You've looked for all the things you've made sure that you don't have any nonlinearity that you haven't taken care of and you still have heteroscedasticity. What do you do? Well, a few things. One of the things you can do is you can move on to a more advanced methodology that would be a best linear and biased estimator under heteroscedasticity. Um, we're not necessarily going to um, do that in this class. We'll save that. Let's save that for another class, um, for another another course. So a more advanced econometrics course. What we're going to talk about is well, how can I continue to use linear regression, just a simple linear model, all right, with heteroscedasticity? And the bottom line is, when you have heteroscedasticity, all right, those your coefficients from OLS are still unbiased. They are still an unbiased estimator. So if you have an infinite number of, of um, um, observations, you're still going to get reasonably close to the true estimate of that population parameter. Okay. Um, the problem is it's no longer going to be best. There will be one out there that has a smaller standard error. Right. So you could switch to that. But for now, we're just going to ignore that because in practice, a lot of times there won't be that much difference. It's not going to be best, but it won't be that far off um, of being best. Um, so a lot of times it's just it, it doesn't necessarily um, make sense to go to the more complicated method um, because you are still unbiased. Um, however, you can go for it. The um, but our standard errors are incorrect and we do have to take care of that. All right, we can't use regular standard errors if we have heteroscedasticity. So let's keep going. What we're going to do is we want a consistent estimator of what's known as the variance covariance matrix. So we've got all this data in there, all right, all these X's and the Y, and you're gonna have a variance for each one of those, you want know, standard deviation for each one of those pieces of data. Um, and you're going to have a um, covariance between each one of those pairs of data. Okay, so you have that for both of those. 
And so you've got this big matrix called the variance covariance matrix. I'm not going to go into all the math and all the stuff of that variance covariance matrix right now, but if we have heteroscedasticity, that variance covariance matrix is wrong. And so starting with a guy by the name of Hal White and moving forward through, um, um, there's um, a, a econometrician named Andrews who contributed considerably to this. And then we have, um, of course, um, Stock and Watson who also contributed uh, massively to this, this literature and, and several others. If you look in your text, you'll see um, kind of a bibliography. You, you'll see citations of different um, papers that are quite seminal in this work. Um, but um, to get these heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors, or better yet, we call them robust standard errors. And the term robust is used, and this is really important, because in large samples, it works for either one. So as long as we have a big enough sample, it doesn't matter. All right, use robust standard errors. And even in smaller samples, so say samples in, you know, more than 30, um, it doesn't make too big a difference. Um, so generally speaking, it makes sense to use robust standard errors. Pretty much, uh, you know, I, I pretty much just say, hey, use robust standard errors. Okay, so let's have a look at this. How do we do it? So we're going to pull in our data. We're going to estimate our model, check, and then we're going to do robust standard errors. And so if we use the JTools package and we use a sum command, we just add robust equals, um, and in this case, I'm going to use what was what's originally done in the book. This is when I set this equal to HC0 heteroscedasticity consistent method zero, which is Hal White's original methodology. Now, brilliant seminal work, but there's been a number of advances since then, so this is not the way I would recommend doing it. Um, in fact, it does give you robust standard errors. All right, so those are heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors. And so you can trust this analysis a little bit better, and it's only a little bit better, would be, um, and these two guys, um, Long and Irvin, basically suggest that using the option HC3 is the best one. And this is the default. So you could just say robust equal true or robust equal HC3. Either one gets you this output. Here's the citation to the paper where they make that, um, where Long and Irvin make that um, suggestion. Um, and you see they're just a little bit different. It doesn't actually change our conclusions at all, um, but this is kind of state of the art. And what's really nice is it's default, so you just say robust equals true, and there you go. Okay, great job. You are well on your way to understanding how to deal with heteroscedasticity.